finally, a source of raw, real, and honest information on healthcare issues that matter most. Welcome to BS Free MD. From the latest medical information to how to stay sane as a doctor or a patient, no subject is taboo, no BS is allowed. Now, let's welcome your hosts, Doctors May and Tim Heinmarsh. Yay, we're back again, and this week we have an amazing guest. We've been corresponding with him, and he is um, an amazing intellect and writer, and we can't wait for you to hear what he has to say. We are bringing you some COVID update news, so I'm sure this will be on the list of favorites again for the year, because you guys love our um, updates that we have on anything COVID. So today we're discussing the new medication that's coming out, a.k.a. Uh, Pfizer-Mectin or Paxlovid. Yeah, courtesy of Pfizer. Per, yeah, courtesy of Pfizer. We're going to touch on actually um, potential benefits, risks of that medication. Is it going to be effective as well as kind of go back and look at what we have had for outpatient treatment and some inpatient treatment as well. Um, so we're super excited to bring you our guest today. Yeah, um, a little encouragement. Uh, Dr. Joel Hersharn has 50, 50 plus years of uh, scientific experience. Uh, we'll get into that. His, he's, he does a good job of explaining his bio um, really, really deep into evidence, um, evidence based science. Uh, he actually comes from, from an engineering background and then did a lot of healthcare work. Uh, really encourage you to subscribe to his Substack. It's free, tons of information. He has been a prolific writer he'll i mean basically what he does he's retired he sits down and he reads for hours a day goes through the actual information synthesizes it into what he thinks the actual raw data is saying and then writes articles so uh, really really good stuff and you know not really political more just kind of good nerdy science which we're lacking and you know? he actually looks at the science imagine that yeah all right so here we go all right we are very excited to have Dr. Joel Hirshhorn with us. He has a tremendous amount of experience in the um, scientific world, examining studies, working um, in the healthcare world, specifically around the science um, of various aspects of health. Uh, so Dr. Hirshhorn, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Certainly. Um, well, I started out after getting a PhD. I became a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I directed uh, a, a research program between the medical school and the engineering college, working with orthopedic surgeons and pioneering some uh, very original research on new uh, materials for surgical uh, orthopedic devices, hip replacements, knee replacements, things like that. So I was a full professor. I described my life as publishing and perishing, very successful at it, but I got... Uh, uh, tired of doing that, and got a high position with the U.S. Congress, Office of Technology Assessment, and I directed major studies uh, for the Senate and House, uh, major studies related to health, lots of work on people getting exposed to toxic waste, hazardous waste, Superfund cleanup sites, looking at all those dimensions of health impacts from what industry had been doing pollution, et cetera, toxic waste, uh, testified as, as an expert witness, testified over 50 times at Senate and House hearings. I was viewed as a very objective, uh, reliable expert on a lot of health-related issues uh, and had a lot of fun doing that work, helped write some legislation related again to health issues. Uh, after that, I ran a consulting company where, again, I worked on health-related issues, actually serving uh, as an expert witness uh, and technical advisor to community groups all over the United States who were facing exposure to pollution and toxic waste. Did that for a number of years. And then I became a senior official at the National Governors Association, which is the trade association for all the state uh, governors, basically. And again, I directed lots of studies related to health issues, uh, particularly my favorite area was the connection between community design 
particularly suburban sprawl and public health and public health, and that we were creating health issues because we were uh, poorly designing our communities, too much automobile dependence, not enough healthy living, basically. I eventually retired. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been an executive volunteer at a major hospital. Uh, and um, my advocacy there is for patient-centered care. But overall, I've been working on health, health issues uh, for over 50 years and got interested in this pandemic as soon as it began. I began to see data in March of 2020, and this is important. <clears throat> I began to see the data coming from France and from Dr. Zelenko in New York State. Uh, and that data in March of 2020 convinced me that we knew how to cure this COVID infectious disease. The uh, guy in France, Dr. Didier, and Dr. Zelenko at that time were focusing on using hydroxychloroquine very successfully. And I might note that Dr. Zelenko, who's one of these great pioneering doctors, wrote the preface, uh, the forward actually for my book, Pandemic Blunder. I'll let me plug that. My book came out a year ago. I was the first one, the first book to go after Dr. Fauci and also to be a major advocate for what we call early home treatment. Originally, it was hydroxychloroquine, a cheap, safe, generic medicine used for many decades. Later, we saw the transition to ivermectin, another cheap, safe, generic medicine used around the world, billions and billions of doses safely. <laughs> and we now know, I keep plugging this in all my articles. I write several articles uh, a month, almost a week now. I have a Substack uh, page and it's called Pandemic Blunder Newsletter. And people, that's free. I don't charge anyone. And I keep publishing articles, looking at all the dimensions of therapeutics. We there should be no pandemic. I, I always I said this in my book, and I'll say it here today. Virtually all of the deaths that we think were due to COVID could have been prevented. Virtually all of them. I'm on the same page as Dr. Peter McCullough from Texas, a very famous doctor. Uh, we've been on a lot of shows together, and I can tell you. He's with me. We're on this 100% and other great people and in, in, uh, medical experts that I trust. All of these deaths could have been prevented if we would have promoted, if Fauci had not blocked the use of hydroxychloroquine and then ivermectin, uh, we could have prevented all of these deaths. I always like to talk about Dr. George Fareed and Brian Tyson in California. They've served over 7,000 patients. Nobody has died. Only two were hospitalized and then safely got out. And I keep, in all my articles, I keep pushing that we have the solution to COVID, okay? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, criminal, it's a criminal disgrace that, that the public health establishment in the United States has been a total failure, total failure. And, uh, and, all, of, and all of the only winners in this whole situation have been the big drug companies, Pfizer and the other fa vaccine makers. I am. I write all these articles with all of the data. I keep giving people the data. The vaccines do not work. Not only are they not effective, particularly they are terribly ineffective against Omicron, which is the new dominant variant, but worse than being ineffective, the vaccines are unsafe. There are enormous numbers of people in the U.S. and around the world who have died because they have taken the vaccine shots. I can't emphasize this enough. The numbers are hard to come by, but there are three analyses that I trust. And in the United States, I think at least 150,000 people, Americans have died just from taking the vaccine shots. And I just did an article, I found some obscure but current CDC data, and I was able to calculate what we say is excess deaths. 
That is, how many people have died during the pandemic over the normal amount of deaths before the pandemic began? And it's the after and before comparison. And I, I was able to do calculations using some very good data that nobody else seems to put their hands on. And I can tell you that I think the right number for excess deaths, these are non-COVID deaths, okay? Real non-COVID deaths. Over 400,000 people in the last two years have died. Now, let's say about 150,000 of those could have been from the vaccine deaths. But we have a, what we call a lot of collateral deaths. What about all the Americans who have died because they couldn't get access to good public health care, because they couldn't see their doctors, they couldn't get into hospitals? So we have enormous numbers of what we call collateral deaths, people who commit suicide, people who went on opioid addictions and things like that. So these are the collateral side effects of the pandemic where Again, huge numbers of people, Americans, and all over the world have died uh, because of collateral effects of the pandemic. And we shouldn't have had a pandemic to begin with, again, because if we would have followed what was known in March of 2020, we would have been using these generic medicines, particularly ivermectin. I'm a strong advocate of ivermectin. I tell people I take it twice a week myself as a prophylactic. Uh, and, uh, and I put out lots of articles showing the data. The data shows that ivermectin works. You know, every time I hear an official from the government talk about following the science, I know we're dealing with a liar because none of the official people at NIH, FDA, CDC, none of them follow the science, unfortunately. And what I try to do in my book and in my articles is help the public understand the true science, the true facts, the true information, because everyone is just getting lies and propaganda from leftist mainstream media and the government. You basically can't believe hardly anything that comes out of the head of CDC or FDA and all the actions they're taking. Now, they recently approved the new drug from Pfizer, Paxlovid, I think that's a, a disaster because, let me, let me say this, number one, they didn't do sufficient testing. They ran through a few months of testing this new drug, which is actually a combination of two drugs. One is a copy of ivermectin. It supposedly acts the same way that ivermectin works to stop viral replication early in the disease process, but it also includes an HIV drug, and these HIV drugs tend to be rather toxic. And the thing about this new Pfizer drug, not only was it inadequately tested for safety, short-term safety and long-term safety, I don't, I don't think many people should take it because it interacts with many conventional medicines and if we're worried mostly about elderly people and, el and people with a lot of comorbidities, all the people who go into hospitals with what, what I call late stage COVID, they, they all have comorbidities. The big ones being obesity, diabetes, and heart problems, okay? So the Pfizer drug interacts with lots of medicines that elderly and other people take and supplements also, some supplements. Now, the other thing about what they did in the clinical testing for Paxlovid is they said, well, they gave it to people within three days of onset. Now, think about this. Within three days. Now, they're, they're arguing, well, you can take it within five days. Let me tell you, any, how is any normal American going to know that their symptoms are from COVID? Their symptoms could be from a cold, from the flu. It's not easy to tell that your symptoms are telling you that you have COVID. And you can't get in to see a doctor these days for days <laughs> or weeks. I say this as an elderly person myself. I have never in my 82 years 
had such troubles getting an appointment to see my primary care physician, even some of my specialists that I see. It's worse than ever. So it, whether it's three days or five days, I can tell you that no ordinary pe- person is going to know within three days or five days that they have COVID. They can't get a test for COVID easily. <laughs> That's also a shame in the United States. And then their doctor would have to see whether there's uh, interactions with their medicines. So they've got to use a pretty good computer system uh, to find that out. Then they have to get a prescription and then they have to get it filled. Okay. But where are they going to get it filled? There's very little of this Pfizer drug around for most people. So I can't see. Now, let me tell you, Israel is very interesting. Uh, Most of us who do uh, medical research follow what's going on in Israel. And of course, they have a contract with Pfizer, so they got all the vaccine early. Now they got Paxlovid early. How is Israel handling this new drug from Pfizer? Well, first of all, all the people in Israel belong to very good, big healthcare systems. They all have computerized systems. They know everything about the health profile of an individual. They can get, and they use taxi cabs, to deliver the Pfizer drug within three to five days. But they can do this because of their computerized system and know exactly whether a patient has COVID, whether there are drug interactions. And then they have a system, which is amazing, that they can deliver the medicine all through computers and taxi cabs, get it into the mouth of of a patient in Israel, within a three to five day period. That's amazing. We have nothing like that in the United States, nor does any other country have anything like the Israeli system. I don't think we need the Pfizer drug, first off, because we could use ivermectin. And I push a a protocol, it's in my book, and I've been pushing it for two years, uh, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc and quercetin for vitamins and supplements that you need to, people need to boost their innate immune system through healthy living. And one of the great failures of the American public health system in this pandemic is they've never pushed healthy living. I can tell you, I lost 70 pounds in the last two years. I was, I got overweight as I grew older. And when the pandemic hit, I said, (laughs) I got to get healthier. And I know I lost almost a third of my body weight. I know it's possible. I think it's easy to do if you just get smart about it. So, but the public health system is a total failure. We didn't promote healthy living. Obesity is the number, I think it's the number one comorbidity in terms of this uh, virus, uh, the COVID virus. Well, we, we should have, the public health system should have been pushing all kinds of things to deal with the obesity. That's a real pandemic in the United States. Some people look at the data for the U.S. and compare it to other industrialized countries. And the U.S. data in terms of deaths per capita, cases per capita, always looks terrible. Well, it is terrible. And one reason the U.S. data is terrible is because we have the most unhealthy people on the planet. Obesity. That's what I've been. Yeah, that's what I've been saying all along. Is Absolutely. you know, when they look at the number of deaths in the U.S., I'm like, well, look at our population. Look at yes. our health. It is off the charts. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. So uh, I want to. So if you have any questions, I, I want to you know, let me handle your. Yeah, I want to. I want to rewind just a little bit because this has been like highly enlightening and and very. Um, I mean, there's just tons of really interesting things that you keyed on. One of the first things that pops into my mind is. How long has Israel been using Paxlovid? Oh, just days. Not not even weeks, I think. It's okay. just, it's very new. So we don't, you know, so obviously that, that there's a lag point there as far as, you know, how, do, how is it working in, in that scenario? Yes. Because, because they have, a, they have a very unique, um, they're very unique in the COVID world as far as therapeutics and vaccines, because they signed this yes. sort of uh, exclusive right. contract with Pfizer, which always... You know the the conspiracy tinfoil hat side of me it goes, 
So, so the 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 only Jewish nation in the world signed a contract contract with a massive German company <laughs> just seems weird. <laughs> what, you know what could possibly go wrong, yeah. right? <laughs> you know. So, and, and, and like, um, can I just? And I want to emphasize that their use of the Pfizer vaccine is absolutely insane. They're now on their yes. third and fourth booster shots. Four. And I want to point out the reason they're going to all the booster shots is because the vaccine does not work. You know, there's all this data showing that the vaccine immunity fades within three or four months, six months, it's almost the effectiveness is almost all gone. So what's crazy about Israel (laughs) is they keep pumping their citizens with this Pfizer vaccine, third and fourth shots. People are still going to the hospital. People are still dying in Israel from from real COVID disease, okay? Because the vaccine does not work. And I, okay. Yeah. So, sorry. So what do you say to people? Because, you know, there, there's a part of this, uh, like, especially in the anti-propaganda kind of world, which is, you know, you see things with your own eyes. Uh, we treat, we've treated lots and lots of COVID patients. Um, our clinic is new. It's private. Um, we've been blessed with lots of monoclonal antibody. We've treated hundreds of patients with monoclonal antibodies. We kind of get a sense anecdotally for how they work, you know, in the real world. So what do you say to people that say, okay, the vaccine doesn't work to stop the spread. We thought it would, you know, which is when we get to 70% vaccination, everything goes back to normal and you can burn all your masks. Well, that didn't happen. That's pretty clear. But, but, but then they, they hang on to this but it prevents severe illness and death. It prevents severe illness and death. And, and it's, yeah, it's and, saving lives by preventing severe and, and, and illness you know, like and death. May, May's sister is a, was a, is a former ICU nurse and she worked all the way through COVID. And of course the last year, um, you know, since the vaccines were out, the vast majority of people that were really ill were unvaccinated. So, so is where, what, where's the, the data on that as this emerges? I mean, is that a, just like a six month or a year long thing. And then it goes away and thus the endless boosters, even though, and, and again, another, another follow-up question on that. I have not seen a single study where they actually studied boosters and had a control group and said, you know, people that are boosted compared to the control group, um, you know, don't die from COVID. Don't go to the hospital. They just looked at antibody levels and they said, well, boost your antibody levels, which to me is, Insane. I was just, I have data just a week old, days old, from the United Kingdom. You, you don't get any good data from our CDC, but you do get some good data from Israel, from the United Kingdom, and some other European nations, uh, and the EU. And I'm ju- I have data right now. In fact, I'm trying to uh, put it together for an article on my Substack page. And that data is just new. It's the first week data for the uh, hospitalization and death for the first week of this year, uh, 2022. And I can tell you that the graphs, the data is insane. Uh, something like 80% of the deaths are vaccinated people. And these are boosted people, okay? So your question, these are people who have not only been vaccinated, but most of them have also gotten bo- the booster shots. And these are the people still going in the UK to hospitals and dying. The death rate is very high. I think they're lying in the United States. I've I've been trying to figure out why we're hearing this complete lie about pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's nonsense. Because when I look at data from the UK in particular, and this is really new data, first week of this new year, and, uh, and it's clear that Nearly all of the deaths, the vast majority of deaths are from unvaccinated people. So the vaccines are not working. The booster shots are not working. People are going into late stage COVID. This is serious lung problems. And it's all Omicron now also. So this is new data. So it's not Delta. It's Omicron. It's people with boosters. Okay, booster shots. So we do have some of this new data coming in. I think there's some big corruption about information in in our country. I don't believe that most of the deaths in the U.S. 
are for unvaccinated people. I just don't believe it at all. First off, the majority of, of Americans, in fact, have been vaccinated, okay? It, it's actually a small fraction that are unvaccinated. Not only that, the vast majority of people and uh, some some experts that I trust, I work with uh, uh, Harvey Rice from Yale University. You can trust him. About two thirds of Americans have natural immunity. If you look at all the Americans who have natural immunity because they got seriously, I mean, they were infected at some point, but they didn't have serious effects. They were asymptomatic or they had mild effects, but they got natural immunity. We have the vast majority of Americans either who have natural immunity or were vaccinated and supposedly have some vaccine immunity, which unfortunately I don't think works against Omicron. But we have new data coming in, by the way, that natural immunity does work against Omicron. It's very interesting. The natural immunity is better than vac vaccine immunity against Omicron. Very important. So now we ought to believe that with this huge percent of the American population having some form of immunity, that it's then that they don't account for most of the deaths in hospitals that are being said are COVID deaths. I think something is, is some lie is going on here. Uh, and I, I, I was listening to some experts from one of the New York hospitals this morning, and he was saying 50% at least of what they're calling COVID patients are not COVID patients. They're coming into the hospital for other reasons, but every time you go into the hospital, they test you for COVID, and then you get a positive test. That hospital now has a financial incentive to consider you a COVID patient because they will make more money if you are a COVID patient. And there are people who are still getting seriously ill because they didn't get any therapeutics early in the stage. So they're in late stage COVID. And what I, I, I wrote articles about this recently. I can tell you that ivermectin has an unusual property that didn't get attention early on. We were always talking about ivermectin as an antiviral, so it would work for early treatment. What we didn't know at the beginning and what research has shown, I've dug into this, is that ivermectin also is an anti-inflammatory. And it's the anti-inflammatory property of ivermectin that actually saves the lives of people who are in late stage COVID on a ventilator, okay, in sometimes not only are they intubated, but they are given terrible, useless drugs like remdesivir. But they're they're in they're in ICUs often for many weeks. Now we have some of these uh, families of these patients who have gone to court and have forced hospitals to give these very ill patients on their deathbed give them ivermectin. And in those cases where these court actions have succeeded, those patients have walked out of the hospital within days. And the doctor said, well, there's only a 10% chance that they're ever going to live because, and they've been in the ICU for three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, okay? But giving them ivermectin turns out to be an effective treatment for late stage COVID with serious lung problems. Yeah, that's... That's really that's really interesting because that's always been the hard hard part for me is that the the you 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 wrote an article about cognitive dissonance in medicine which I think is brilliant I love your Substack and and I'm always a big picture person if I had a if I ever started a consulting firm it would be called Ten Thousand Foot View um, I'm I'm a licensed skydiver I have over six hundred skydives and you know so I'm used to looking out the open door and going okay that's where I'm supposed to land and that's where I'm not supposed to land. So big pictures and is, is kind of how my brain works. And so when you look at the the just in total data, the more infections, more deaths, and then the new stuff that's coming out, which is really which you alluded to earlier, which is the all cause mortality deaths, so excess deaths. And and you go, well, if the vaccine worked, why is there more patients in the, in the hospital? Like forget the cases because yeah, case, case numbers easy. have always driven me driven me crazy but there's still tons of deaths there's still you know there, there's still all this weird 
you know, public policy stuff with, especially with kids, that's causing all sorts of, you know, the diseases of despair and all the right. co collateral damage. And, and, you know, that's been something that that's always bothered me, which is, okay, if the vaccine really works and it really works even against severe disease, why is there still all these people that have died in, you know, 2021? And like, I, I, I can't really make a go of it yet. It's really difficult, you know, again, cognitive dissonance. It's really difficult to go, okay, yeah, but the government's just lying. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tough pill to swallow since we're talking about pill. What was interesting, by the way, just a, a quick fact. <clears throat> if you looked at the CDC data, and it's in my article, more people died in 2021 when we would, everyone was getting vaccines, okay, than in 2020 when nobody was getting vaccines. So the death rate went up after we gave vaccines. And I want to say, I have all these new articles, brilliant articles. Some guy in Canada just did an analysis, which is so unbelievable. He looked at countries all over the world. And the bottom line is what his analysis shows, this is really sophisticated data analysis. The more vaccines you give to people, the more people die. OK, it's that that's the bottom line, that vaccines cause more deaths. Period. That's that's what the data shows when it's analyzed accurately, objectively. OK, why are they dying? Well, because, in fact, some people just die from the vaccines. But it turns out the more that you get vaccines into your body, these new generation that are really not even vaccines, they're just genetic things out there, drugs that, that people are using, that, but the more you get them into your body, you actually lower your immune system response. So it makes you sicker in the long term to get vaccinated, which is why they see higher death rates in countries with higher levels of vaccination. I always like to point out the countries where ivermectin has been used, they all have low vaccination rates, India, Indonesia, uh, the latest data from Japan. Uh, we have a bunch of countries where uh, the pandemic numbers are very good, actually, where they've essentially knocked out the pandemic, especially in most of the uh, big India states, because, and the vaccine levels are very, very low. So when you have a combination of low vaccine use and high ivermectin use, then you get into a very positive situation. But in most of the first world countries, the industrialized countries, it's a very bad situation because we're still pushing. Again, I think some of the best doctors, uh, hundreds of doctors, I've signed all kinds of uh, petitions and things saying we ought to stop mass vaccination. The mass vaccination is not the solution in this pandemic. And it may take years for the truth to come out. But eventually the truth will come out. I think it's coming out slowly now that, in fact, the vaccine mass vaccination is a complete fraud. It, it's only positive in terms of making billions of dollars for Pfizer and the other vaccine makers. OK, all of the executives of Pfizer and these other companies, they've all become billionaires literally overnight because of the vaccine um, market, basically. So. By interrupted, I let me. I should let you. No, I mean it. It makes that's been my the thing that's bothered me with this whole pandemic, and I think even patients, uh, non medical people, that are you know are have been seeing it as well. It just seems very obvious. Is so who's where's the money trail, and why why have we been pushing just the vaccine? I mean, so at the beginning, I was you know we were thinking okay potentially this is. Maybe, maybe going to be something that's helpful, a tool in the pandemic to vaccinate people if it's going to be effective. But what, aren't we doing anything else to keep people out of the hospital when they first get sick? But but no, it was when we were we've been working COVID clinics since COVID began. And initially it was tell them to go home and just try to get better until they're in the hospital. And and we look at each other and think, where in the history of disease and patient care have we ever told a patient with anything just go home like take two aspirin and don't call me until you're in the hospital like never i mean even 
talked about the HIV you know crisis when that came out. We were throwing everything at people to try to suppress the HIV, and it was one experiment after the other what we could do. And I said to Tim, like aghast, and a lot of our colleagues, this is insane. And now when people get sick with the fever and kids, and if you've got a fever or a cough or you can't breathe, you can't even come into our clinic because you might because you have COVID. We won't even see you. Like it is, it's the insanity of it is like when did doctors stop taking care of their patients until they were in the hospital when it was too late i said can you imagine if you did that if you had like a urinary tract infection and well i'm not going to give you anything until you're septic and dying or i'm not going to treat your right. rotting limb until you're i mean it's just blowing my right. mind Are and you- so that's when for us as medical professionals and now the lay people have gone this is crazy because they're pushing this vaccine only and no one, no one's allowed to even try the hydroxychloroquine, the ivermectin, the high dose vitamin C, the vitamin therapies, the combinations. Let's look at what we have already, gazillions of medications existing that are safe. And let's try well, those. Right. It, it That's where the whole conspiracy to me just like lights up. When have the history of medicine right. have doctors not been allowed to try to keep people out of the hospital. Well, one of you not being allowed to use an off-label drug, and the in the in the example I use all the time is, you know, um, in the state of Oregon where we live, you, a 15-year-old woman without parental consent can go to a gender clinic and get off-label testosterone because that's politically acceptable to do. But if I write a prescription for ivermectin, and the only code in the chart is COVID, they will report me, and my license is in jeopardy. So tell me how that makes sense, no. right? I mean, yeah. it it's it's political. It's like you're committing this crime by giving someone no, ivermectin, which, you know, I laugh, of course, at the everyone calling it horse pills <laughs> because, you know, amoxicillin is a horse pill too. We give that to our cats and dogs so, and horses, right. yet ivermectin gets labeled as the horse medicine. Well, but you know, I, 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 it makes no, no sense. None of it does. And, and my book, Pandemic Blunder, which is still available on Amazon, It came out Uh early in 2021. And so I was pushing, you know, therapeutic early home treatment in my book. And I explained in my book that Fauci had stopped the use of early home treatment. And it was a a criminal. It was it was a criminal act that he did. I, I said in my book, he ought to be prosecuted, criminally prosecuted. I think Fauci is responsible for all of the the disaster, the deaths, all of the pain and suffering. Uh, He is the one person that I blame more than anyone else uh, for what has happened, the mismanagement of the pandemic. I wrote an article, I use the term personalized medicine, and I wrote an article or two that, you know, good doctors, good physicians have always tried to use personalized medicine. The drug should fit the patient, okay? You you know, that's their Hippocratic oath. First, do no harm, you know? So it, it, it's been a failure of the, of the medical establishment. Unfortunately, the medical establishment, the public health establishment has gone along with the corrupt government actions by NIH, FDA, and CDC. And that's all led by Fauci, essentially. So- it's it's sad that most doctors. Uh, I I just I, I tried it myself. I, month, many months ago, I asked my uh, physician, my personal physician. You know, I just I need a. I would like a prescription for I think ivermectin. I asked him for. I said, oh, listen, I've researched this. The hell, I have a book out on. You know, he said I can't do it. My computer system won't even let me do it because there is no approved use of ivermectin. I can't give you a diagnosis for anything that will allow my computer system <laughs> to give me a pres- give you a prescription for ivermectin. Exactly. This is this is corporate medicine, okay? Because he's part of a of a big hospital healthcare system. So uh, this is what's sad. Doctors, unfortunately, most of them, unless they're independent, uh, like you apparently, uh, most physicians in the United States, their hands are tied or, or they're risking their jobs. I get these emails. I'm trying to help physicians who are losing their jobs. I want to emphasize, I have several physicians who've contacted me. Very sad stories. They are losing, have lost their jobs 
because they were trying to use ivermectin in in their hospitals. Oh, I mean, I know, I know it. You know, you even mention uh, ivermectin as a physician as a treatment option anywhere in public on social media, like I have done in forums, and then people threaten to report you to the board right. for medical misinformation and malpractice. And I'm like, you're kidding. You're kidding me. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it is just, it's the, it's like a war. It is really, it blows my mind. I never could see medicine going down this path. Yeah. I don't use social media. Career. So <laughs> no, smart. I, I social you're very media, smart. So I'm free to do, do and say whatever I want, but, uh, I've, I've done over a hundred podcasts and, uh, some of them, you know, <laughs> tried to put it up on, on YouTube. And of course they, it doesn't last. So. Right. So I've been a little skeptical and haven't researched a whole lot on Paxlovid. I mean, other than, you know, the, the little bit we've been doing, because I guess I'm already biased in, with what we've got for the flu currently, which, you know, the, um, uh, yeah tamiflu. yeah, tamiflu, which is, you know, for a while, for a few years, I thought, eh, maybe it works. And then it was kind of like a dice throw. Sometimes it yeah. would seem to help people. You mean, I, I've taken it three times. One time I thought it was a miracle drug. Another time it did nothing. Sometimes it helps people in yeah. certain situations. Sometimes it doesn't. So um, we, so far, haven't really had very good antiviral treatments for flu, you know for the flu i'm not talking for these yeah, kind of respiratory, these kind of viruses, respiratory viruses. Right. so that's i mean i've already been kind of a skeptic with this one because it's come out so quickly um so is there i mean i know that you're not on the medical background but i mean is there anything different in it that you'd say maybe it might work better um than tamiflu because it's kind of got more of the hiv medications or is that going to be a detriment because of all the potential interactions with with uh, medications. Well, I don't have a lot of confidence in this new Pfizer drug. I I, yeah. I wonder why physicians, well, see, that they're trapped. Physicians will, will feel that they have to prescribe uh, the new Pfizer drug because they can't prescribe, let's say, ivermectin. Well, anything okay? else. So now right. we put them into this, this trap. Pfizer is very smart. I, I think, and I said this in an article months ago, I think they see the end of the vaccine business coming. And they, Merck and Pfizer were clever business people. They said, listen, this, this bonanza that they have in terms of vaccines, that's not going to last. So we have to create new drugs that we can, you know, uh, create patent and all that stuff and, and, uh, and make them very expensive. So, you know, the new Pfizer drug is incredibly expensive. I don't think it's going to be that successful because I don't think people are going to get it fast enough. It has to work. The whole theory uh, behind it is to stop viral replication, which is that first stage of COVID disease. Now, can you act quickly enough? That's the whole thing. Can you act quickly enough to get that in and will it work effectively and will it be safe? We have no data really on long-term safety of the Pfizer drug. So why would, yeah, you know, why would a physician give it? You know, if, if, a, if, a, if a physician was really thinking a lot about it, he might question the, the legitimacy of, of giving a drug that, that was rushed through. And I mean, rushed through and FDA didn't even use their own approval process involving outside experts. They didn't do that. They skipped that. So the whole, the whole situation looks corrupt from, from the beginning. And uh, so maybe the drug will be used. I don't know. Around where I live on the East Coast, it's not readily available. Uh, very little is available, actually. Uh, anyway, but I saw so I have a negative view of, of the Pfizer drug. Again, and people, physicians better be very careful. The drug interaction is a big issue. In Israel, they are dealing with it because they have a very sophisticated system that can look at the drug interactions very quickly and very effectively. And they can get the drug into the hands of people very, very quickly. If you take the Pfizer drug 
too many days too late, the viral replication right. process will have already begun and gone too far. So the therapeutic won't really work. I mean, there's so many things as far as the infrastructure, the size of the country, the number of people, the right. infrastructure, the medical system, all that that we've talked see, about in getting that. See, we're, we're doing almost exclusively COVID in our clinic. And so we've had great success with getting people in right away. Um, in, in, in the urban, more urban centers, it is a total disaster. So I actually have uh, what I'm looking at is I have from the Oregon Health Authority um, because we're signed up with them to get monoclonal antibodies, which is distributed through the Oregon Health Authority from the federal government. And there are this coming out week and it will be every other week, a two week cycle. There's 4,120 doses for the entire state of uh, molnupiravir, which is the Merck drug, which, which is terrible. doesn't doesn't <laughs> appear to do yeah. anything. And then there's a thousand and forty doses of Paxlovid for what's what's our population like four million, three and a half million, something like that. So yeah, it's, 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 it's wow, wow, what a waste. It's I mean, being it's, on a forest fire, right, you right, know? Yeah. right, exactly. And it's even worse. You know, I live in a much higher population area. Okay, uh, outside Washington D.C. And uh, so I think it's going to be an insignificant factor in terms of pandemic management. So let's talk about what I think is what I what I believe is the ultimate pandemic management, which is what's managed every single pandemic in the history of mankind, which is natural herd immunity. Um, and, I, you know, I was out at a, I was out very late last night. I was at a rock concert and I was trying to explain this to a lot of my friends who are really quite diverse as far as backgrounds and, you know, political bend and all this kind of stuff. And I said, look, you know, what stopped every pandemic has been, um, you know, up until very recently with things like, like polio and smallpox has been natural herd immunity, you know, black plague stopped because eventually it, it either killed enough people or, um, you know, enough people got partially ill and, you know, immunized themselves. So do you believe that Omicron is from, you know, data, especially in other countries is mild enough um, that it's just going to spread like fire and kind of, and kind of burn this out and be the greatest passive immunization, in, you know, to date. Yeah, I, I'm, I agree with that school of thought that it looks that way to me. You know, a lot of people think we already have herd immunity in the United States. It's, it's, you know, I think Omicron will definitely increase immunity in the population without serious effects, okay? Why some people will get seriously ill from Omicron, and they are, I have no doubt that some people are getting seriously ill from Omicron, but these are probably inherently very unhealthy people. These are people with lots of comorbidities who don't have a healthy lifestyle. Uh, obese, diabetic, heart disease, you name it. And uh, so some people will always get seriously ill, even for something like Omicron. You see, I, I did a, a couple of articles. I follow a French research guy named, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, I can't think of it now, Fantini, uh, a great French researcher. And he had done all of this research analyzing the Omicron, uh, the, all the variants, actually, of COVID. And he was the first one quite a while back to do enough research and, and actually calculate and showed that Delta would be devastating. And he calculated what, what's called the transmissibility index of each variant. He looked at the molecular structure of each variant. Fantastic research, very sophisticated research. And then uh, Omicron comes along. So he does a, his new ca does a calculation using his methodology and his research capabilities. And he calculates Omicron is not going to be as bad as Delta. It's, it has all of these mutations. And he's the guy who looked at the nature of the mutations in Omicron. And he figured out that all of these mutations actually lower the transmissibility of Omicron relative to Delta. It was still higher than the older variants, but it wasn't as bad as Delta. But he also showed through his research that vaccines would not work <laughs> against 
Omicron. And I have all this data now from Danish work and UK work and all these various countries that shows, in fact, exactly that, that the vaccines work less effectively <clears throat> against Omicron as compared to Delta. So some people are still getting, people keep talking about highly transmissible Omicron. You see that in every media story, you know, highly transmissible oh, Omicron. This sounds like a cold to it, me. Well, well, it turns out what, what I want to <laughs> emphasize, it looks like Omicron is so transmissible, not because it is inherently transmissible. The molecules that get into the air are not very special. The reason it looks transmissible is that none of the immunity that people have, most of that immunity is not working against Omicron. So we get this picture that all of these people are getting sick from, from Omicron. And these are vaccinated people, I want to emphasize, that are getting sick because the data is absolutely clear that the vaccines are very ineffective against Omicron, much worse than their effectiveness against Delta. Okay? So this is the, this is the situation we're living in now. And why some people are ill and dying, again, I think those deaths could be avoided in, in hospitals if they started to use ivermectin. Remdesivir, which they're still using in hospitals, does not work. Not only doesn't it work, it's dangerous. It has terrible side effects in terms of organ damage. So nothing they're doing in ICUs, this is what disturbs me, the protocols being used in American hospitals for very ill COVID patients, late stage COVID, serious breathing lung problems, okay? It does happen even with Omicron. Their, their protocols don't work. And I think, the, you know, they know it doesn't work because their patients are dying. And we know from, again, a small number of people who've tried the ivermectin in late stage COVID, we know that that is a solution. It does work. Nothing that the hospitals are using now, the, the, the new Pfizer drugs, it's, they're not even aimed at late stage COVID. So <laughs> we're dealing with this terrible uh, hospital situation where people are dying after weeks in the ICUs. And, and the hospitals are making a fortune, unfortunately. The bills are incredible. For you stay six weeks, eight weeks in an ICU in an American hospital, you can imagine what, what the bills are. Uh, and maybe some of them have good insurance that will cover it like Medicare, but not everyone has that. Right, right. So my understanding on Paxlovid, um, I know this, uh, I'm fairly confident that it's it's with, with the Merck drug as well, was that it, they're actually uh, repurposed old HIV drugs that they modified. You know, they added a molecular, you know, an, an enantiomer here or right. a hydrogen bond or, or whatever the case. So it's not, I mean, you can say that I've, you know, go after ivermectin, it's an old medication, but that's the whole point. It's repurposed for a, a different purpose. And we have like tremendous amount of safety data, but my understanding is both of the anti the oral antivirals for COVID were actually re repurposed old drugs that didn't really work that well for their initial you know, they had them on the shelf. They blew the dust off of them. They did some molecular right. magic to it. And they go, oh, look, we have a new drug. Well, that's it. They, they had to play around. I've been told by some experts <clears throat> that they basically played around with ivermectin. And they had to play around enough with ivermectin so that they can get a patent, so that, you know, they can get a proprietary drug Great. out of it. Right. Okay. But when, when you look yeah. at how does Paxlovid work? It works ex supposedly, in theory, exactly like ivermectin, except ivermectin is very complex. And it's, you know, we still can't even figure out, again, all the aspects of ivermectin, why it works so well. But I get people emailing me all the time saying, hey, I took ivermectin and in two or three days, I was, I was well. 
uh, after getting, you know, what they thought they had, or they had tests saying they had gotten COVID. So I don't think this new drug is makes any medical sense. Again, people are going to have to be very careful in taking it. And now you have this other antidepressant drug, fluvoxamine, which is also being touted. And, and I must admit, I think there's probably just as good data for showing that fluvoxamine works against COVID as the new Pfizer drug. And fluvoxamine is, again, another cheap generic drug, okay, been around for a very long period of time. It's an anti, originally an antidepressant, anti-anxiety kind of drug. It seems to work pretty well against COVID. I just got some. I order all my stuff from India. I've told people it's in my web, it's on my Substack page. I put the actual contact information on where people can order ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. They can order fluvoxamine too from two companies that I use in India. Uh, you know, I have a, th- a thousand. I always tell people this story. I have a thousand uh, pills of ivermectin because I I just try different companies. And by the way, these are all, when you get ivermectin from India, there are 12 milligram tablets. If you can find ivermectin in the United States, which is very difficult, they are three milligram tablets. They charge usually about $5 per three milligram tablet. I get 12 milligram tablets from India, 12, and it's 30 or 40 cents a tablet, okay? The same with fluvoxamine, relatively cheap. I just got a package from India. Same with hydroxychloroquine. So, because people were always asking me, well, how do I get this? I don't like them using the ivermectin, which is meant for animal use. They have to play around with figuring out how much to take. And I, so I'm, I've never been supportive of that because I know you can get, I, now the problem with what you're getting it from India, it takes a while. The package, you know, it takes a month or so right. after you order it. But my wife got some ivermectin in the United States. We wanted to see, she got a prescription, had to pay money to get a prescription from a, a telemedicine doctor. And she paid $5 a pill for three milligrams. And uh, I said, this is crazy. This is absolutely insane. Uh, and you can't get it, by the way. Merck stopped producing it. Interestingly enough, why did Merck stop producing ivermectin? Well, <laughs> they don't want to sell ivermectin. So it's hard to, I'm not sure anyone else is making it anymore in the United States. Wow. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Th- there is another question that I think is really important because I think it can really give hope to some people. How did you lose 70 pounds yeah. in two years? as a 82 year old person when, you know, the pounds just don't come off cause I'm too well, old. Yeah. You know, we've all told ourselves that. No, it's crazy. I, 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 again, I always followed the medical literature <laughs> and I was convinced by all the stuff, uh, scientific stuff that I read that if I would just stay with a low carbohydrate, high protein diet, not worry about fat very much, but focus on not eating the worst carbohydrates, all the white carbs, the bread, the pasta, the rice, the noodles. Stay away from the carbohydrates. Try to focus on a daily high protein diet, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits. And, uh, and it wasn't a problem. And, in, and it's not, I've actually, I stopped losing weight many months ago, actually. So uh, I'm, I just have been stable for more than six months now. Absolutely. But the, the trick is weighing yourself every morning. <laughs> you know, you got to use that weight information to influence what you're going to eat that day in terms of calories, in terms of, you know, a limited maybe amount of carbs. I found all of these wonderful products out there. There is a fake kind of pasta that you can find. I, find, I buy it in, in my Safeway supermarket. It's made from some sort of vegetable. It's basically zero calories. It looks like pasta. It feels like pasta, but it's not pasta. It, it's, made from, <laughs> it's zero calorie 
vegetable product. Uh, sounds like car. Sounds like cardboard to no, me. Or, or it sounds <laughs> like voodoo. It's a wonderful product, and uh, and I'm a great cook, and I use it all the time. And uh, and I I do a lot of wok kind of cooking, so it's it wasn't that difficult to lose a lot of weight if you. Don't drink alcohol. Stay away from the carbs. Stay away from sugar. See, the thing about body chemistry, alcohol, sugar, and white carbs all do the same thing in your body, basically. Mm -hmm. It's chemi chemically speaking. So if you stay away from alcohol, sugar, and carbs, that's the big trick. And just focus on a pretty high-protein diet. Uh, and don't worry about vegetables and, and fruits. Eat all you want of those. Uh, yeah, that's it. No, that, that that's. It sounds like we've been what we've been preaching for the past right. thirty years. Well, of and our it, it sounds it sounds like what she's been preaching to me for the last thirty years of our marriage. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I I hear you there. Well, we could we could go on for hours. This has been really great. I love uh, hearing from people um, that are really strong in the scientific community, but don't you know so they're kind of un unjaded from a lot of the the things that we have to deal with as clinicians where you know we're inundated with information from pharmaceutical right. companies etc cetera, etc cetera, where we're in our own sort of bubble our own sort of group think so it's always nice to 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 get from the outside because you know we rely on experts um just like you rely on the the clinical expertise of any physician that you see we rely on the scientific uh scientific expertise of people that you know look at studies all day long, which we don't do. Um, so w once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been wonderful. Yeah, it's been really, really great. And what we'll do is we'll um, get some of those articles yeah, and so your sub stack and everything, and we'll put it on our, uh, in our sure. show notes. So, so, so people can yes. get the, they can get the actual source information for your sub stack. We will link that. Uh, for that Canadian uh, study that you were talking about for maybe some, some from the, uh, the French scientists with regards yeah. to, you know, the epidemiological right. stuff. Yes. I really like to link a lot of hard data so people can look back and go, you know, we're not just crazy tinfoil hat wearing people that think everyone should take ivermectin. Right. And um, we can definitely, we'll link your book as well, which is still available yes. on Amazon. Yeah, oh, correct? Absolutely. absolutely. Perfect. Miracle, miracle and it was the first yes. book. You know, <laughs> it was the first book to go after Fauci. I want to, you know, now now other books have come out, but my book came out the beginning of 2021, and I went after Fauci. Some people were amazed that I got it published, but I, and I got it. It was up on Amazon right away. It's been very successful on Amazon. Very cheap. The Kindle edition is e either no money or very little money. Uh, yeah. So it and it's still valid today. The book. If people with I wrote the book because I used to be a professor and educator, and I wanted to write a book for the general public to really, really inform them with good data. The book is filled with data and all the websites, too. I, I give people all the many websites that they can go to to get access to the data. Perfect. That's what that's what they're after. And us as well, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you. I appreciate it. Well, that was awesome. I love, and I said it a few times during the interview, I really love getting the perspective of somebody who isn't a clinician. Um, we may do a show on this entire topic, but the peer pressure in medicine to kind of go along with a narrative or the narrative or the herd is really profound. I think... I actually wrote it to, um, I can't remember who I wrote it to. It was somebody in, you know, one of the scientists I was corresponding with. And I said, you know, I might've even been Joel. I said, physicians are more prone to peer pressure than, you know, a couple girls behind the school in, in eighth grade with a pack of smokes. I don't know. I kind of liken it more to the earth is flat and everyone in science believes it. Well, and it's just, it, you know, it is. And and that's the thing that's really interesting because we're going to have um, – we're going to find out that a lot of the people on the skeptical side, which, I mean, we obviously are if there's a side, you know, there's stuff that we got wrong. Oh, uh, absolutely. I think they and, – and, But on the, other, on the other hand, the people that speak with the most ferocious certainty 
are almost always wrong. That frightens me. I mean, you have to be humble, willing to admit when you're wrong. And willing I mean, to even Peter sides. McCullough came out in um, on Joe Rogan and was really dogmatic about you can't get COVID twice. And then he backpedaled the next like a week or two later. And he actually called Robert Malone because he knew Robert was going to be on Joe's show. And and he was like, no, with Omicron, I think the game has changed. And I think you can get it more than once. Mm-hmm. And so because the science evolves and you evolve with it, if you're humble and you're willing to see things, I mean, I looked back at at uh, messages that we were getting from listeners, and uh, I think it was February of 2021, which seems like 4,000 years ago. You know, people go, oh, time goes by so fast. Yeah, unless you're in a freaking pandemic, then it tends to go slower. And and, and the, the literal quote that I had was, herd immunity is how you get out of a pandemic. The vaccine should hasten herd immunity, ergo the vaccine is the fastest way out of the pandemic. Which is exactly what I thought in February of 2020, uh, 2021, and exactly why I got vaccinated in January, because I felt, you know, the data wasn't great, but it didn't appear to be horrifically dangerous, et cetera. Well, you look now, and, you know, especially having got the vaccine, having got COVID, there's no way in hell I'd get a booster. And, and, and you look at, like, the abject failure of the vaccine to do exactly what we were told it was going to do, which the science and Pfizer itself said they didn't think they didn't know if it did, which was prevent spread. And so now we're seeing all this other stuff that you can't really explain. I mean, is there antibody dependent enhancement? Maybe you can make an argument for or against that. There's all of these downstream consequences that people like great virologists and vaccinologists like uh, 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 Geert, uh, what's his name, Geert Vandenbosch, were uh, you know warning about all of this kind of. St- you know, these kind of things like this could happen, that could happen. I mean, before the vaccine was available in November of 2020, I was reading about vaccine associated disease enhancement and what vaccines had happened in. And so I was, you know, I I was sort of primed for some of this. And now where you see absolute failure, at least failure of transmission, maybe success in uh, preventing serious illness, at least so far in the United States, it appears to be that that that's the case, but God only knows. And you're like, you change your mind because science means that you're going to change your mind. Calm down. You're really excited. You're really excited. Today. Well, I'm ready to go to work and kick, kick some COVID, kick some COVID in the nards. I, I can tell. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we can't wait to um, bring you more like this. I will link um, his book and his sub stack in our show notes. Send us your questions, ideas. We love your feedback. Keep sending it. See you next time. It's no secret that medicine is a bit um, uptight. That's why Tim and I created BS Free MD to mix things up a little and have fun in the process. Besides, we are having these exact same discussions all the time, so we thought we might as well invite everyone to the party. If you really like us, you can get plenty more and maybe see one of Tim's cool tattoos on our Instagram or Facebook pages at BS Free MD. See you next time. Well, we try to keep BS Free MD as raw and real as possible. We can't be held responsible for any medical decisions or discussions had as a result of what you've heard on the show. We know. Bummer. But the truth is, we really do care about your questions. So feel free to reach out to us by email at doc at bsfreemd.com. All right, we've got to do two, three, four. <clears throat> Five, Talk, four, three, two, two, one. Kick, kick, cover it in the dick. So that the Crowder. Maybe you can make a dip, ditty out of it. There once was a man from Sweet Home. Oh, uh, let's Who see. It was about the size of a gnome. There once was a man <laughs> named Fauci. No. Who liked the jab, the Fauci ouchie. Once was a man from Sweet he Home. He said with a who grin. Was the size of a gnome. He yeah, we're put on now. his. We're going to do a Fauci limerick, though, I guarantee <laughs> you. That is an absolute 100% promise.